In this video, I would like to propose an explanation for the observation of stagnating wages in the United States, although labor productivity still rises, and this explanation is based on the use of industrial robots. The source for this chapter is uh, the paper Stagnant Wages in the Face of Rising Labor Productivity, the Potential Role of Industrial Robots. The motivation for this chapter is summarized in this figure here. What we see is the wage rate per hour worked in the United States, that's the solid line here, and labor productivity in terms of output per hour worked, that's the dotted line. And what we see is that from the 1970s onwards, the late 1970s onwards, a gap emerges that grows larger over time. And I want to address this, the question, what explains this growing wedge? Because uh, standard economic theories, such as the solo model with a standard Cobb-Douglas production function, would imply that wages and labor productivity always move in lockstep, as we will see in a moment. And indeed, until the 1970s, the real wage rate and labor productivity moved in lockstep, so they increased together. But since then, they have diverged markedly. And it's uh, perhaps a coincidence, but it's uh, interesting that at the same time, the number of industrial robots increased quite strongly. So industrial robots were invented in the 1960s. So the first firm that uh, deployed them was um, in uh, 1963, General Motors, and uh, then since the 1970s, 80s and so on, there was cons uh, constant growth in the number of industrial robots, and in the last two decades, basically, the number of industrial robots um, increased quite strongly. So the aim of this uh, chapter is to analyze the extent to which this divergence between wages and productivity can be explained by automation in terms of the use of industrial robots. Of course, however, I do not claim that industrial robots explain everything, and there have been a lot of other theories as well for why wages and productivity diverged over the last decades. Very prominent one is that the market power of firms has been increasing. For example, um, Van der Lecker and co-authors argued this in the paper in uh, 2020. And the intuition for that is, of course, if there is um, a higher market power for firms, they can charge a higher markup over the marginal cost. The marginal cost is, to a large extent, determined by um, workers, also by, by the wage rate, because uh, labor is an important input in production. So if firms can charge a higher markup, they, uh, the profits that they earn by that, um, they do not need to be transferred to the workers, basically. So the gap between the profits and what they pay out as wages would increase. Another theory is that labor unions, the power of labor unions, declined over the large, last decades. So labor unions negotiate wages, and if their uh, power to negotiate wages decreases, then the share of um, total um, uh, income that goes to the workers would presumably also decrease. And over the last decades, uh, what we observed is a decreasing uh, unionization rate. So the share of workers that are members of unions decreased, and at the same time, unemployment increased. And both would, in theory, reduce the uh, negotiating power of uh, unions. So, so that is uh, an important and interesting theory in this context. Uh, a paper that relates to that is by Dinardo uh, and co-authors in 1996. Then Karababunis and Neumann in 2013 explained the declining labor income share by the decrease in the price of investment goods. But in all of these papers, uh, automation as such is not uh, really addressed. But we know from the papers by Asimoglu and Restrepo and many others that automation has the potential to reduce wages. So I want in this chapter to analyze whether automation can also be an aspect that explains the uh, uh, increasing gap between wages and labor productivity. Now I start here with uh, some theoretical considerations where we first suppose that we are in the pre-1970 period and there are no industrial robots um, dur during that time. So the number of industrial robots is still very low and we assume that we are in a world without industrial robots. 
So then production can be given by the production function of the standard solo model by Cobb Douglas production function, where output yt is produced with labor lt with an output elasticity of 1 minus alpha and capital with an output elasticity of alpha. Capital here would be machines, assembly lines, production facilities, and so on. But the crucial point is that this form of capital requires workers to um, produce something. So an assembly line cannot produce something on its own, or a machine, or a, a production hall, for that matter. So we have a certain complementarity between labor and this traditional physical capital, as I call it, which is signified by the Cobb-Douglas production function. And I also allow here for labor augmenting technological progress. Now it's well known that the wage rate in this context amounts to the marginal product of labor if uh, the markets are competitive and the marginal product of labor is the derivative of the production function with respect to LT. What we get is one minus alpha comes down from the exponent, um, alpha remains, so this LT moves to the denominator. Um, on, and basically what we see here is that this is nothing else than one minus alpha times output itself divided by LT. So if we have so we have the wage rate here, and we have that this is a function of labor productivity here, and if we divide wages by labor productivity in terms of output per hour worked, then we get this difference, and this difference is one minus alpha. So it's a constant. There is no way by which wages and labor productivity in this world can diverge. As long as alpha is a given constant, the two would always be tied together and move in lockstep. So if labor productivity increases, so would wages. Now suppose that we are post 1917s and industrial robots have been invented and are deployed in firms. Then the production function basically changes. A new production factor becomes available that is different from traditional physical capital in the sense that for the first time in history, capital can produce output on its own. So an industrial robot can be used along an assembly line and fully substitute for, for a worker, basically, and then physical capital can produce on its own. That's what I consider here, but I uh, kind of weaken this a little bit. I allow for a more general structure where I introduce the robots, denote them by PT, the productivity of robots by VT, and I assume that there is a CES sub-production function where workers and robots are um, basically substitutable, but the um, elasticity of substitution is determined by gamma. So if gamma goes to one, they would indeed be perfect substitutes. So then you could imagine that an industrial robot indeed perfectly substitutes for a worker. But if gamma is smaller than one, uh, and say larger than zero, then they are still gross substitutes, um, then they can be substituted for, but perhaps not perfectly. So this would account for the fact that robots still need maintenance, perhaps they need to be reprogrammed or supervised or whatever. <clears throat> but gamma would be between zero and one, and gamma would determine the elasticity of substitution between robots. The closer gamma is to one, the better robots can substitute for workers. We can again compute the wage rate, which is the derivative of the production function with respect to LT. And now we see that things are more complicated because another term shows up here. And this term contains industrial robots. So they affect the wage rate of workers. Then um, we can compute labor productivity. <coughs> and labor productivity would be output per hour work. So we divide the production function by LT and get this expression for labor productivity. Now what we observe here is that if there are no industrial robots, so PT is zero, then this production function collapses completely to the production function that we had before industrial robots were introduced. And also labor productivity would be the same expression as before. So it is divided by LT. Now, however, we have industrial robots post-1970, and therefore we now compute the wage rate divided by labor productivity again, and we get a more complex expression than before. So previously, without industrial robots, this was just one minus alpha, and the wages and labor productivity would always move in lockstep. But here we have it's one minus alpha, and then 
times um, a function of uh, productivity and uh, the number of workers. And in the denominator, we also have productivity, the number of workers, and crucially, productivity of robots and the number of industrial robots, where we see that if this term increases, the whole term here would decrease. So the ratio of wages to labor productivity would decrease if robots are accumulated or their productivity increases. If there are no robots again, so if PT is zero, this term um, drops out, then this term and this term cancels, and we are again in the pre-1970 world where the ratio of wages to labor productivity is a given constant. Post-1970, however, a wedge between productivity and wages opens up and it's driven by progress in automation. So the higher BT, the productivity of robots, or PT, the number of robots, the greater the gap between wages and productivity becomes. Now we can summarize the insights so far. So the theoretical model shows that indeed we can explain the increasing gap between wages and labor productivity by the use of industrial robots. And from kind of a timing perspective, what we would have is that before the emergence of industrial robots, the wages grow in line with labor productivity. So if the economy expands and labor productivity increases, wages also grow. So the two move in lockstep and there is no way they could diverge from each other. But after the widespread adoption of industrial robots, the progress in automation drives a wedge between the wages of workers and labor productivity and this wedge increases with um, automation. So in the age of automation, what we can observe is increasing per capita GDP and a rising labor productivity at the same time as wages stagnate or even fall. So automation can explain to some extent what we observe. The question now, of course, is how much of what we observe in the data can be explained by automation. And for this, I simulate the model using reasonable parameter values. I set alpha equal to one third, which is in line with uh, the standard literature. I set gamma equal to 0 0.75, which implies an elasticity of substitution between workers and robots of four. So they are good substitutes, but by far not perfect substitutes. And uh, this is uh, in line with uh, papers by Urquhart and co-authors in 2021 and 2022. Then I um, construct growth in labor productivity from the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis data. And I do the same for uh, the volume of hours worked and for the evolution of the capital stock. For the evolution of uh, the number of industrial robots, I rely on data by the International Federation of Robotics. And I construct growth of productivity of robots based on International Federation of Robotics data as reported by UCAT and co-authors in the two papers. Now, um, I would say that this is the uh, most problematic uh, series, uh, data series, because um, here we do not really have a lot of data on the productivity of robots, and therefore it relies a lot on um, assumptions about the uh, increase in productivity. So that's also the reason why I later on provide a sensitivity analysis of what happens when growth in productivity is less than uh, the growth in productivity constructed out of the data here. Now the result of the baseline simulation is displayed in this figure here. Using the parameter values and the uh, evolution of the different variables as shown on the previous slide, what I get is uh, hourly wage rate in the United States that is almost stagnating. It's increasing slightly, so it increases a bit more than in the data, but still it's almost stagnating while labor productivity increases by a factor of three, exactly as we observe in the data. And the wedge between the two opens in the beginning 1980s, so a little bit later than in the data, but the wedge is almost the same as we observed it in the data. And the picture looks strikingly similar to the picture that we've seen previously, um, where I displayed the data for the United States. So based on that, we could argue that um, automation explains the rising wedge between wages and labor productivity surprisingly well, actually. 
However, as I said before, there is a lot of uncertainty surrounding these results, particularly with respect to the evolution of the productivity of robots. So what I conduct uh, in uh, the next figure is a sensitivity analysis where I reduce the productivity of robots substantially by more than um, 30 percent, so the growth rate of the productivity of robots. And what I get then is um, that the wedge between um, wages and labor productivity decreases quite strongly. But nevertheless, the general picture still seems to be true. So wages increase only sluggishly and labor productivity increases by much more than wages. And the wedge between the two opens in the 1980s. However, now also uh, labor productivity does not increase anymore by a factor of three, but just by a factor of a little bit more than two. So it's less in line with what we observe in the data. So I summarize. The theory tells us that the emerging gap between the real wage rate and labor productivity can, in principle, be explained by automation. And the numerical assessment uh, tells us how much uh, we can explain by automation. And the baseline simulation would suggest that a surprisingly large share of this gap can be explained. But of course, I'm aware there are many other theories around and there is a lot of uncertainty in the data. So I would think that um, what is particularly needed here is further estimates on the underlying parameters and the evolution of underlying variables, particularly on the productivity of robots to be able to make more substantiated uh, claims actually on this difference between um, labor productivity and wages.